Hey guys. Hey. How are you doing? Just let us know in the chat, just at the beginning, how do you feel about the AP US history exam? Like on a scale of one to five, how ready are you? Five. A six. Nice. A six, that's pretty confident. Nice, the threes are good, threes are good. Um, can you also comment on um, what states you're from? Nice. East Coast. Oh, Arizona. Wow. California. All right. Um, we have 23 people so far. So I say that's good enough to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Q&A, y'all. Um, I'm Lee. Uh, I'm Austin. Um, we are new streamers for Fiveable, so this is our very first stream. Um, but uh, just put your questions in the ask box and we will answer them. But before, before we do that, uh, first, this is the weekly stream calendar for all the other live streams that we have on Fiveable. Um, those of you who've been with us for a while probably know this already, but if you don't, this is our streaming schedule, and you can also follow us on social media. Um, we have a TikTok, a Twitter, an Instagram, and a YouTube. And I've heard our uh, TikTok and our Instagram are pretty great. So uh, put your questions in the Ask a Question tab, and we will answer them. And just as a reminder, uh, next Thursday, there is going to be a big AP, a five hour AP, a, a push cram session. And if you haven't bought your bought a cram pass yet, um, go ahead and get it. I guess $5. Yeah. Well, your cram passes are, if you have a cram pass already, then you'll get into it. But if you just want to watch the live cram session, five hour cram session next week, it's only $5. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and answer the first question and thank you Perla for answering it as well. Um, can we use our digital digital notes or does it have to be hard copy only? Um, again, you can use any notes just like Perla said, but um, also know that College Board may also be watching your screen. Um, so just be aware of that. Also, one big thing that was went, gone over in a previous live stream um, that went over new exam specifications is that you cannot have a Google Doc open that anyone else has open because that would be considered collaborating. So if you're gonna use digital notes, make sure that either they're A, not shared with anyone, or B, are a copy of the shared notes that doesn't have, don't have anyone else uh, shared on them. So um, honestly, it, it's a matter of preference, but make sure that you don't um, void your exam in any way by accidentally sharing them with anyone. Exactly. Um, Parker is asking what the highest yield topics to study would be. And that's pretty subjective because it depends entirely on what you feel confident in. Like for me, I'm pretty good with Civil War and antebellum stuff, but I'm pretty weak with the Gilded Age. So I would definitely focus my studying on that, um, on the Gilded Age. Um, Make sure to review like what you're confident with, but focus the, the majority of your time on um, the stuff you're less confident in. Um, that being said, some pretty high yield topics would be um, like reform movements. Um, and I would recommend studying on the antebellum era because there hasn't been a GBQ on that in quite a few years. Um, it's period four. Period four, it's it's crazy because it starts at 1800 and then ends at 1848. So there's a bunch of history in the middle. Like you have the founding of the country all the way to pre-Civil War stuff. Like there's, that's a large chunk. And that hasn't, again, like Austin said, that hasn't been a DBQ for a very long time. So there's a high chance that it is actually going to be from period four. But uh, don't that because I actually really don't know. I don't work for College Board. <laughs> Okay, so we got a question on the Palmer Raids and Harper's Ferry. So these two events are not really related, 
But the Har Harpers Ferry was um, a federal armory, and I believe it was in West Virginia. And the famous abolitionist John Brown um, led a raid there in 1858. Um, and his mission um, was he had a dream that he was inspired by God and ordered to free the slaves to start a rebellion, just crushing slavery, um, ending the system. So he and his sons um, raided the armory at Harpers Ferry um, in order to um, get weapons. Unfortunately, the fed federal government sent troops there and they, they pretty much, they crushed it. He was hanged, um, but it galvanized abolitionists um, against slavery. Um, and that, that kind of put them in the position of wanting to end slavery forever. Um, it was set in their minds. And the Palmer Raids happened during the first Red Scare, right around the 1920s. And um, that's basically the federal government um, um, arresting and, um, suspected communists. Um, it, it was just like, um, they pretty much took away a lot of their rights, due process, that kind of stuff. Um, not super important. I would say the Red Scare is a bit more important, um, but for sure, um, for sure, an impor important event in um, the the, um, the era between wars in the Roaring Twenties. Yeah, Palmer Raids were uh, November 1919 to January 1920. All right, um, our next our next live stream is going to be the cram session uh, next Thursday at, let's see, is that 4 Eastern time? Yes, 4 mm -hmm. Eastern time. Um, we will be on, again, we'll be on for the first two and a half hours, and then the um, APUS teacher will be on for the last two and a half. Um, oh, I just accidentally answered a question. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I think it was about William Lloyd Garrison in yes. Leading, Kansas. So William Lloyd Garrison was another abolitionist who um, published a newspaper called The Liberator, and that was firmly against slavery, um, total abolitionism. He wanted to give slaves um, full rights, um, total freedom. They want them to be equal with the whites, and that was really not, a, um, not popular in the South for obvious reasons. And uh, Bleeding Kansas um, was uh, violence that arose after the Kansas-Nebraska Act in the 1850s. And that was what happened. Um, so the Kansas-Nebraska Act allowed for popular sovereignty in the Kansas and Nebraska territories, which meant that um, the citizens got to choose whether um, it would be a slave or free, free territories and states. Um, despite them being above the 36-30 line um, designated by the Missouri Compromise of 1820. And, and so what happened is you have a lot of pro-slavery and anti-slave people coming in to vote, and there was a, a ton of violence, and it was given the name Bleeding Kansas and Eastern Newspapers. Okay, and Sandra is asking if we should still know about periods not explicitly tested up on the exam. And I would say so, yes. It's probably a good idea because um, it's contextualization and um, historical context you can use for analyzing documents and for your introduction, introductory paragraph. Um, I would say especially um, periods one and two. Um, Period eight and nine are less important because they're later, so they're not causing events in period seven. Um, but I would for sure be um, familiar with stuff like the Columbian Exchange, um, the differences between the northern, middle, and southern colonies, and some of the English heritage and um, background um, before the Seven Years' War. Right. Yeah, um, and I guess for periods eight and nine, um, it is still something good to know, but is not necessarily good to know for the exam. 
All right, can you explain the War of 1812 and the Quasi War? All right, Quasi War was under Jeff Jefferson, right? Uh, Around yeah. that time? Okay, it was under John Adams. Yep. Oh, Adams, okay. I was that was 1900. All right, that was one that was never really declared and it was fought almost entirely on at sea. And it grew out of the XYZ affair. Um, let's see. Yeah, the closer was undeclared. Um, mm -hmm. It was mostly over trading and commerce because the French were firing on American ships, uh, but the U.S. really um, could um, commute with the French Navy, so they really weren't able to declare war. Um, but the War of 1812, that was about 10 years later, a little more than 10 years later, and that was between U.S. and England. And that was also um, um, caused by a lot of maritime and trade factors. Like the English were impressing or taking U.S. sailors onto their ships and forcing them to, to work for them. and um, they were there was a lot of trade disagreement between the U.S. and England about um, what the relationship would look like, um, whether the U.S. would be kind of subsidiary and still have to trade only with England, like um, like what happened when there were some colonies. And it ended up um, with the Treaty of Ghent in 18, 1815, um, or 1814, I should say. Um, uh, it resolved that no territorial changes, no one gained any land. But um, the U.S. was a little more unified as a nation. Um, they, they were all um, more or less against the British. And it also resulted in the end of the Federalist Party because um, the Federalists were more business-friendly and trade-oriented. And the war with England was um, destroying trade. So um, leading Federalists called, called the Hartford Convention in 1814, which was an attempt to make peace with England and end the war. Um, unfortunately, it was not recognized by the English, and um, uh, as the convention was going on, Andrew Jackson won a huge U.S. victory at the Battle of New Orleans, which made the Federalists look very silly because they were trying to make peace while the, um, while the U.S. was winning a battle, and that pretty much discredited the Federalist Party and caused the, the end of them. And this is where the era of good feelings began. Um, for the next decade or so. Right, done. Answering, um, to know if uh, we have any more free live streams, I would check the Fiveable website for that one. I'm not certain, and I think this is the last free one, but don't, I'm again, I'm not really sure about that. Okay, we've got a question about Wilson's 14 points. So this was delivered in a speech by President Woodrow Wilson after World War I. And basically it outlined how he wanted um, foreign relations to, and world peace to, to look after the end of the war. Um, again, not super vital, but definitely it's something good to understand. Um, it kind of, he kind of started the League of Nations. That was also an idea of Wilson's, but unfortunately for him, um, um, the Democratic Party um, lost the um, election of 18, uh, or 1918. So they, the Senate did not allow the U.S. to join the League of Nations, which um, totally weakened it. And it kind of ruined his 14 points because um, um, the League of Nations was not able to maintain peace in Europe, especially not without the U.S. Um, as a member. Yes, and Perla in the chat, uh, didn't Wilson die for trying to advocate it? Yes, he actually went on a, a nationwide tour trying to promote it and then um, basically died of a broken heart because he no one liked it. Um, and this was during his presidency he had a stroke. An, an interesting anecdote, um, his wife, um, Edith Wilson, um, pretty much um, ran his day-to-day -day life and um, filled in for him for the last well, couple, couple months of his presidency. And he died in 1923, I believe. 
All right. Um, what are some good suggestions for how to use outside information and what are good examples of outside information? Um, outside information, let's see. Is outside information is basically anything that is not in your document. So if you have, there's some fact, or actually, sorry, it's not in any of the documents. So if there's something that comes to you that isn't in any of the documents, then that's automatically something you can use as outside information. Um, some good examples are, I think, related dates, like dates around the time that your document was in. Like if you document something about, um, it starts talking about something Andrew Jackson did, then you can, um, go back and say like what led up to it or what resulted from it and just weave that into your argument. Because remember your outside information has to support your argument. You can't just put in a random fact and have it um, get, you, get you that point. And we can go over, um, we have the rubric at the end of this slide, well these slides. And also to add on to that, um, make sure that your information is specific. So it can't be just an overall theme. It should be a specific event um, for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, because you need to be able to um, explain it and then connect it back to your theme. So make sure you're being specific with it. Yes. All right. Um, again, periods one and two, uh, they are not on the exam. Oh, okay. That, uh, not on the exam, but good for contextualization. Uh, Treat of Greenville. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Elijah. Um, it's right. Um, so when the U.S. Um, uh, the Northwest Ordinance was passed um, in the Northwest Territory, a lot of federal troops moved in, and there was a lot of violence. Um, like there were quite a few in, uh, wars. Like Little Turtles War, I know, was one of them, and um, there were a lot of treaties that forced the natives, um, either forced them west to places like Illinois, Wisconsin, um, or um, they uh, constricted them to smaller spaces. And at this point, the reservation system was not established yet. Um, but these were de facto reservations in, in all but name. All right. Uh, famous reform movements. Let's see. Um, mainly I, my biggest, the ones that I know the best at least are the ones around the time of the Gilded Age when, um, after big business kind of took over and the United States had a very big laissez-faire approach to economics. And then when Theodore Roosevelt became president, he said, no, I'm not going to do that anymore because the public was like, hey, these big businesses are kind of taking, taking us over and taking advantage of us and we don't like it. And so Teddy Roosevelt said, yes, I'm going to go trust busting. So that's when you have the antitrust act. And that was one of the main things that he ran for on his ticket. Um, do you have any other reform movements that you can remember? Oh, um, temperance and progressivism, and then... Yeah, temperance is a big one, um, the American temperance thing. Um, we talk about abolitionism. Um, yes. That was a bit Sorry. earlier. Um, so you see abolitionism and women's rights getting their start um, during um, the Second Great Awakening, which is a big religious movement. Um, um, well, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, the Second Great Awakening um, was... It started around the 1820s, 1830s. Um, and out of the, it, um, there were many things it promoted, but among them was the idea of human perfectionism, that humans could be perfect, or they should at least try to um, make the lives of themselves and others around them better. And that's how a lot of reform movements got their start, especially in the North. Yep. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, Hull House, um, a lot of immigrant education. Um, Jane Addams was a big um, um, aid to immigrants. She formed a lot of those immigrant houses. Um, uh, abolitionism, of course, um, got set around now. And also the Seneca Falls Convention really kick-started the women's suffrage movement um, with uh, uh, the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments. Um, all men and women are created equal. It drew heavily on Enlightenment ideas like um, natural rights, um, equal rights. That kind of stuff. And yet, Perla, Dorothy Dix, Prison Reform. Um, 
President in asylum reform as well. Um, also Horace Mann, um, the beginning of the public school system, especially in the Northeast. Um, um, standardized curriculums. Um, uh, the decline of small local um, religion-centered schools in the Northeast. Um, you get a lot more state-run schools. Scrolling back to make sure we didn't miss any. Um, yeah, temperance, and that led to uh, prohibition, and then, um, which didn't really work because people started smuggling alcohol anyway. Um, temperance was mostly a women-led movement, although there were, obviously there were some men involved. Um, but it got so it got bad enough that some temperance people would go in and break into uh, taverns and bars and then smash caskets and bottles of alcohol. Um, and so eventually that led to uh, the banning of all alcohol in the United States. And a good way to talk about those amendments is the 18th Amendment is um, prohibition and the 21st is um, you could um, repeal it. And of course, in the drinking age, so. Um, Parker, what do you mean by religious reform or religion reform? If you mean that new denominations sprung up, you're absolutely correct. Um, Baptists and Methodists in the South, right. um, um, those, those um, denominations of Protestantism were founded at this time. And obviously, um, the Southern Baptist Church is actually the largest single denomination in the U.S. other than the Roman Catholic Church. Um, new lights versus old lights. Uh... <sighs> New Lights Result Lights. I'm not entirely familiar with that. Um, oh, I think it has I, to do with um, um, preachers. Um, they, they sort of believe um, different ways, perhaps. Um, yeah. We, you know, more. New Lights, um, those are the people who really wanted to do the, uh, like they were all into the, yeah, new revival, new religion, new ways of presenting information and uh, getting the religion out to the people, whereas the old lights were like, no, we got to do it the way we did it before because it's how it works. And the new ways, either like not according to the Bible or it's just not going to work or we can't use that. So it's, um, you can compare that a little bit to like different ideas of enlightenment. And um, also you can compare that to uh, loyalists versus um, revolutionaries, but that, that that one may be a stretch and also that's not necessarily in the periods. Um, they could be boomers. They might've been boomers. You're right. <laughs> uh, I'm sure they're considered that at that time. Yes. Yeah, I do think that the older populations were more of old lights and the newer, younger populations were new lights. Um, are you supposed to include the A-push themes in your DBQ? I think that's ki kind of. Um, that's not the main focus because the DBQ prompt will usually give you a specific theme to, um, to talk about. Like it could be social, social, maybe social reform movements during the Gilded Age, or it could be political divisions during the um, during the antebellum era. Um, so typically, it will give you um, a, a more narrow theme to focus in. Like you're not going to be talking about geography and culture and um, American identity all in the same essay, right? Like you shouldn't be saying, yeah, Sandra, you're exactly right. You shouldn't be saying, um, you shouldn't be like using the words, um, this theme was, um, the, the theme of it is not the point of the BBQ. Um, similarities and differences between domestic policy during World War One and World War II. Well, leading up to both wars, and um, um, and until the U.S. got involved in both in 1917 and 1941, respectively, there was a strong um, isolationist feeling um, among most um, most citizens. Um, so, um, before World War One, um, the Monroe Doctrine was still kind of in effect. Um, people um, still b believe the idea that the U.S. should stay out of European affairs. Um, 
but um, events like the sinking of the Lusitania um, uh, and the Zimmerman Telegram, which was a German attempt to get Mexico to the end of the war on the side of the Central Powers, not on Germany's side, um, those kind of provoked public opinion to war, war um, which we did enter um, in 1917. Yeah, and an um, important thing to note about World War One is, and I think mostly World War One. I'm not so sure about World War Two. Is that we, um, America sold weapons to both sides before we got involved. So, like at the beginning of World War One, um, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand was actually done with an American-made revolver. Um, and another big thing is the sinking of the Lusitania was always covered up as like a, oh no, they killed civilians, we must go to war now. But it's highly possible that that, that the Lusitania was also smuggling weapons overseas. Yeah, no um, evidence in the last decade that that was likely. And um, the Zimmerman telegram, I, I feel like that one was fabricated, but I'm not I'm not remembering correctly. Um, I do know that Mexico said, no, we're not gonna fight America again because last time we fought America, they stole half of our country, which was the Mexican-American War. Um, and then World War II, yeah, Perla said the lend-lease lend and cash carry policies, that's right, um, but mainly, America didn't want to get involved until it was absolutely necessary. And then in World War II, when we were bombed by uh, Japan, uh, then that's what, that you attacked America, you put an attack on American soil, now we're going to go to war. Um, and it, yeah, I think that's that's it. And yes, uh, that is actually our next question. Uh, actually, I do have one more thing to add, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Um, after World War I and World War II, there was um, a big economic boom. Um, so agriculture production during World War I had exploded um, because there were a lot of, the US government had a lot of subsidies to farmers in order to keep them producing food for the war effort. Um, and the same happened after World War II, although with industry. Um, so the most, um, most economic, economists agree that World War II was really what pulled the US out of the Great Depression. Uh, and the US was just producing so much it was called the arsenal of democracy because um, we made um, so many of the weapons um, that uh, after the war, it transitioned pretty smoothly into um, back into civilian manufacturing. Um, yep, exactly. Okay, so finally, um, can we explain the homestead strike and the AFL? Yes, we can. So the homestead strike was um, a um, very large, perhaps um, the most important um, strike during the Gilded Age. So what happened is at the Homestead Steel Plant, which was um, owned by Andrew, Andrew Carnegie, um, the workers basically just stopped working um, because of poor conditions, um, low wages. Um, yeah, they were, they were specifically like, specifically they were protesting a, a wage cut that would, had been proposed, and they were like, "No, we can't function on even less money when we're barely surviving now." Um, I think it was yeah increased hours and uh, they they wanted to um, increase hours and reduce the wage. And what happened was um, the manager of the the, um, the factory, um, I think Henry Clay Frick was his name. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, um, consulted with Intercon and DMA they tried to crush the protesters. So they brought in private detectives and there was a lot of violence. Um, there was a big fight. Um, a, lot of, a lot of protesters were killed along with some of the detectives. And eventually I think um, some armed troops from the National Guard um, came in and restored the situation. And the work was ended up losing. Yes, yeah, Henry Clay, Flick, Henry Clay Frick, that his name is very hard to say, um, he sent in the Pinkerton guards and uh, they were met by the protesters, I think it was like 10,000 protesters um, who were armed and they had a big fight. And so yeah, then the National Guard got caught in and then the protesters were completely crushed. Um, the AFL, if you're done, if, are we done with Homestead Strike before we move on? Um, if so, the AFL was the labor union uh, made by Samuel Gompers, and it was really the only one that America would tolerate because it was 
it didn't get political. It was didn't lean too much towards socialism. Um, and so it, it was like the very neutral one. They didn't do fights. They were focused more on um, nonviolence because violent protests were immediately shut down, which is another reason why the homestead strike is a really big turning point because after that there were a lot more, there were a lot stricter rules on um, labor unions. A lot of them got cut or destroyed, um, but the AFL managed to stay out of trouble and I think it's still around today. Um, and it also stands for the American Federation of Labor. And there was a similar group called the Knights of Labor. Um, mm -hmm. They were a little more secretive, um, a little more exclusive. Um, it's a secret club of uh, labor organizers. Yeah. Um, and they, um, they got disbanded after a while um, because of a few violent strikes. All right. Can you explain the differences between the Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening? So the first Great Awakening um, was the 19, sorry, not 19, 1730s and 1740s. Um, and that was a new religious revival that came along um, when and it primarily affected Protestantism, it came along with Enlightenment ideals, whereas the Second Great Awakening was the 1800s, early 1800s. Um, and again, it was a new um, a new way to try to get more people into the Protestant religions. Like the Great Awakenings didn't really affect the Catholic Church as much. They were mainly Protestant focused, which was um, likely because the Protestant sects had more power to try to attract people, whereas the Catholics were very like, this is the box you must fit in and you cannot get go outside of it. So they wouldn't really try new things. Um, and it's worth noting that both Great Awakenings were very emotional. Yes. Um, they, the preachers, the preachers um, um, kind of threw themselves into the crowds, um, preaching like um, fire and brimstone is one famous sermon from the First Great Awakening. Um, you're going to get punished if you don't repent. So there's a lot of very, lots of emotions coming out of this. And um, out, of, out of the Second Great Awakening came the, uh, the aforementioned reform movements, like abolitionism and women's rights. Um, mm -hmm. And they both did give birth to new denominations. Yes. Yeah, Sinners at the Hand of an Angry God, Agatha. Yeah, that's a good title. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good work for that one. All right. Yeah. Um, there's a question with three votes down at the bottom. It says, can we practice analyzing documents? We actually have a couple for you guys to work on when we're done. Um, oh, now it's at the top. Uh, when we're done answering questions, we can go straight into our document analysis. So. Okay. Um, we're getting asked, do you think the DBQ will be doing unit three? Now do you think the test is going to start with um, Manuel Miranda giving words of encouragement and then reading the prompt? This is due to the special stream they had with him. I have not heard this, um, but. I have not either. It, I mean, it could very well be. Um, I think unit three is semi probable. Um, I looked at recent DBQs and for the past five years, they've all been like period five and before. And I think there was like one colonial one in like 2017 ish. Um, my personal guess is period four again, because we haven't really seen that many period four ones. I don't think we've had a period four DBQ since 2013. Um, although bringing in Lynn manuel Miranda may also be like a college board hint towards period three, but I'm not sure that's how they work exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually kind of sad I missed that one. Uh, I yeah, I know. Exactly. Yeah, it'd be a thrill. All right. Um, can you go over American colonization and its effects on World War One? Uh, American coloniza colonization, as in America making colonies, or I assume that's what that means. I, mean, I assume that's what that is. Imperialism. Imperialism. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, making colonies. Yep. Thank you. Andrew. Awesome. Um, so it would help to look at the context of the situation um, here, because America was a little bit later in the process of making its own colonies. Um, yes. Worldwide, it's called um, second wave, um, second wave colonization, and you'll have a lot of European powers colonizing Africa um, and China indirectly. So the U.S. Um, eventually, like at the end of the 18th century um, or 19th century, I'm sorry, um, 
gets into the action here, um, and they want to like create create an empire, but Spain is in the way to a lot of things that they want. Spain owns Cuba, Puerto Rico, um, the, the Philippines, Philippines. Um, and a lot of Pacific islands. So, um, conveniently, there are a lot of rebels in Cuba that are um, rebellion against the Spanish governor, who was who was really cruel. Um, so the U.S. Well threw support the behind the rebels, um, and they sent the USS Maine, which was a protected cruiser, um, down there to as a show of force and to evacuate the U.S. Um, U.S. councilman because there was a, there was growing unrest. Um, it sank, obviously, it blew and sank. And what people um, historians today believe it was a magazine explosion. Um, basically, its ammunition blew up, but. Um, Sensationalist, um, sensationalist newspaper headlines um, swayed public opinion toward war. Um, they totally blamed it on Spain, um, despite it not necessarily being true. So there was very little resistance, um, public resistance, to going to war against Spain. And long story short, the U.S. Navy um, crushed the Spanish Navy in battles in the Philippines and Cuba. And um, what ended up happening was Spain gave up um, pretty much their entire overseas empire. Um, the U.S. Um, annexed the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and some Pacific Islands, but Cuba was allowed um, to remain independent um, um, due to a couple, the Platt and Teller Amendment. Um, mm -hmm. but, but the U.S. still um, was able to influence Cuban politics, and that was through the Platt Amendment, um, I believe. Um, but the Teller Amendment ensured that Cuba um, could not be annexed by the United States. Yes. Um, and as to its effects on World War I, um, I would say there's a causation there um, because World War I was really caused by European colonization. Um, so I'm not quite sure what you're driving at here, but... Um, Colonization certainly brought the U.S. in more contact with the Europeans. Um, I mean, it made them, I guess, feel a little more European with the whole empire building and all. Um, but World War I was mostly caused by European factors. Um, yes. So, because the yeah, U.S. didn't even enter until 1917, as I've already mentioned. Um, so I would not, um, I would, on my essay, I would not um, say that, that imperialism um, cause World War One. Um, there's a comment underneath this one. I think it shows, by song it, I think it shows that World War One was a continuation of American world involvement. And I think so because I think previously there was a policy of isolationism. And then once the Spanish-American War started and the whole idea of American colonies and American imperialism, that's when America started to get more um, into world events and wanting to become more of a world power. So, but note there was there was also a resurgence during the Great Depression of isolationism. Yes, because world trade grinds to a halt. Um, international interactions are also um, drastically reduced. So um, isolation comes up again. Um, it becomes more popular um, during the Great Depression. But yeah, that's that's certainly right. All right. Um, can you explain the Bracero program, the Tuskegee Air Force, and the effects of Spanish flu in period seven? Um, I can. I know about the Tuskegee Airmen and the Tuskegee Air Force because um, I'm actually from Alabama. Um, so I can answer that part. Um, Tuskegee Airmen were a group of all African American um, fighter pilots who were trained in Tuskegee, Alabama. Um, there's actually a really great uh, play about them called Fly. Um, I'm not sure if it's available anywhere for you guys to see, but just as a note, um, they were one of the most successful uh, units in World War II. Uh, they were the Red Tails, and I, they never lost a bomber. Like They managed to get all the bombers, uh, protect all the bombers. Um, it was a really revolutionary thing because they were uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, were an all African American unit in a period before um, integration, and their involvement in the army um, allowed for a little bit of headway in the civil rights movement, which is, I think, that's more period eight, but it's still important. Mm -hmm. 
And yet, um, a lot of you are right, the Braceros were Mexican migrant workers that came um, to the U.S. during World War II. Um, because a lot of U the U.S.'s young male population was overseas fighting. Um, and many of them were working in factories, which created a shortage of agricultural workers. And so the U.S. Um, initiated the Bracero Program, which is a series of laws that um, um, allowed Mexican, um, Mex Mexicans to um, not necessarily immigrate, but come for, um, come for the seasonal harvests um, to provide added labor. And it just made sure that um, they were fairly treated. They were given a quote unquote adequate wage. Um, I mean, 30 cents an hour is not that great. Um, but yeah, just um, uh, importing labor during World War II. Um, also, the Spanish flu. Sorry, I missed that. Um, so, the Spanish flu, um, how appropriate for right now. Um, <laughs> came out of, um, it um, started spreading right at the end of World War II, or World War I, sorry, World War I. Um, so um, it spread all over the world. Um, it actually killed more people than World War I did in four years. Um, I don't know a ton about it. Um, I believe it infected a lot of young people. Um, it was very deadly. Um, uh, exposed the need for um, better medical technology um, and eventually it's culminated with the discovery of penicillin and other antibiotics um, in the future but other than that I'm not super um, super educated about that right same here um, I think the biggest thing about Spanish flu is the um, just how it affected population wise and what it did for uh, medical field and hygiene, just kind of kind of like how the Crimean War, for those of you taking your, kind of like how the Crimean War um, affected medical technology uh, back in Europe. So, all right, continuity and change throughout periods. Yeah, that's a really big question. Um, actually, uh, how about um, you guys um, go in the comments and type in some things that you might, you think would work for continuity and for change. Yes. You can try to find one example for each. Shift from rural to urban, industrialization. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, rural to urban, that that's a big one. Um, yeah, social reform. reforms. <laughs> Yep, Sonia, that's good. Yeah. Oh, sla the issue of slavery. Yeah, that that's a big one too. Sandra, demographic divides is a bit general. You might need to specify that a little more, but um, that definitely has promise. Um, um, between like segregation. The southern way of life. Um, it's, again, I think that one's also a little bit general, but I guess you mean like antebellum period to reconstruction to civil rights, I guess. Rich versus poor. Uh, yeah, social stratification. Um, westward expansion, that's another big one. Yes, yeah, that's, that's one that's actually in period four. Um, economy, also a bit general, but definitely an important one. Um, Depends what you mean by economics. I mean, if you're talking about um, the, the system, um, yeah, from um, that when Jackson killed the bank, um, the Bank of the United States, and got rid of um, um, the central banking, all the way through the Great Depression, there was a, um, a cycle, what's called boom and bust. Um, so you have a lot, of, um, a lot of really good economic times, and then you have a lot of periods um, where there are panics and recessions. Um, like the panic of um, I'm afraid of the year. Um, it was right after Jackson left, like 1837 or something. Um, yeah, kind of good. Seven. Yeah, because that's the one that that's the one that Martin Van Buren um, had inherited, and then no one liked him because of that. Yep, exactly. He's one term president. All right. Um, earlier, you said like industry. So I guess uh, 
I assume that's a Gilded Age question. Um, the industrialization. So yeah, industrialization definitely changed the economy um, because that's like when the stock market started gaining power and when um, big business started gaining power as well. And banking was a big thing. Uh, yeah, market standard, yes, market revolution, uh, industrialization. Um, that was that was a big thing as well. Political machines. Okay, yeah, actually political machines would be good um, because you can tie that in later with um, lobbying organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you do need to be careful there because that is um, lobbying really takes off um, in periods eight and nine um, with the rise of Reaganism um, and the conservative resurgence. But yeah, Boss Tweed, um, Tammany Hall, those are um, they, they, that's all very good. Yeah, and I think we're going to talk more about continuity and change when we do our cram session next Thursday. So um, we'll we'll this question will be answered definitely more in depth uh, mm -hmm. then. All right, dollar and big stick diplomacy. Okay, so big stick diplomacy was uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, uh, speak softly, carry a big stick. Um, basically, I, that, I think that one's more of like a intimidation technique, whereas dollar, di dollar diplomacy was taft and where alliances were basically bought instead of intimidate, like you would intimidate someone into an alliance. And taft focused more on um, paying people to have an alliance and it's debatable which one is more effective um i was taught that big stick diplomacy was more effective because if you intimidate someone then they're they're too scared to go against you whereas if you if you pay them there's actually nothing stopping them from going back against you and dollar diplomacy versus big stick diplomacy was actually a really big thing um when theodore roosevelt uh ran for the second time because the first time he did his four years and then he basically named Taft as his successor. And since everyone loved Roosevelt, they were like, mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to vote for Taft. And then Taft decided to do the dollar diplomacy thing and a bunch of other things that Theodore Roosevelt didn't like. So he said, Hey, Taft I'm going to run very hard on, um, on trusts. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, Taft ran on the Republican ticket and then Teddy Roosevelt was like, well, I'm not going to win against him. I'm going to run as the bull moose party with the progressives. And then um, that actually split the Republican vote. So um, half of pe half of the Republican, usually Republican leading people, voted for uh, Taft. Half of them voted for Roosevelt, which was like that split the vote, which meant that Woodrow Wilson got the majority of the vote. And that's that's a big problem with running as a third party on a ticket, which is actually kind of relevant to now. Um, is that if you split the vote, the other party is going to win because people are going to be too focused on little things um to fully go towards one um one candidate i keep forgetting to hit start answering on these um federal government involvement with political parties in period four so there's really two two um areas in period four um, of conflict you have early on the federalists um against the democratic republicans and then later, you have the um, Jacksonian Democrats and the Whigs. Um, so we want to start with the Federalists. So that's our early. Um, so the Federalists were mostly in New England. Um, they preferred high tariffs, um, which would protect industry um, and trade. They wanted to trade with, um, to, to ally themselves with England because they had a larger economy, um, more colonies. Um, it's a bigger economic block. Um, and meanwhile, the Democratic Republicans, um, they were led by Thomas Jefferson um, and James Madison. Um, and Jefferson is pretty well known for his ideal image of American, um, which is like um, a subsistence farmer, um, making enough to survive, um, living off the land, and being very independent. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, a big, a big thing, a big split with the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, or as they're sometimes called the Anti-Federalists, is geographic uh, location. Federalists usually lived in the north, northeast cities, whereas the Democratic Republicans lived in the south, where they were mostly plantation owners. Um, so the Federalist policy of high tariffs and trade with England, um, that actually hurt them a lot. Um, because those high tariffs would mean that no one would buy from America and they wouldn't be making money. 
Um, another thing about uh, anti-federalists or um, the Democratic Republicans is that they wanted to go uh, assist France, which was another big problem um, in when the French Revolution happened. Um, the Democratic Republicans wanted to go aid the French in their revolution, whereas the Federalists were like, no, no entangling alliances. As that was a Washington thing. Um, no entangling alliances. We don't want to get involved with this. We're too new as a country, and it's probably a bad idea. Yep, the Federalists did believe in a loose interpretation of the Constitution. Yes. Um, the Federalists and Alexander Hamilton, who was considered the leader of the Federalist Party, um, he wanted a very strong federal government to um, to regulate and help the economy along. And uh, meanwhile, like um, the Jeffersonian Democrats definitely wanted a, um, stronger state governments and local governments. And Jefferson was much more of a fan of the Articles of Confederation. And in fact, he um, praised Shays' rebellion and Whiskey rebellions, um, saying that, um, I think he said, like, um, a little rebellion is good from time to time. He liked that people were challenging the uh, federal government um, their policies. Um, yeah, I'm double checking yeah. that second question about Federalists and Democratic Republicans to Democrats and Whigs, because I actually have a chart on that. Um, but yes. Um, and the, the interesting Whigs thing about were, ideologically, the Whigs were much close, more closely aligned with the uh, Federalists of several decades earlier. Um, yes. Um, so the, the biggest leader was Henry Clay, um, and he's pretty well known for number one, losing a lot of presidential elections, and number two, um, the American system, which was an attempt by the federal government to create infrastructure, um, a lot of roads and canals, especially in the north and um, protective tariffs to allow um, northern industry to grow. And this was, a, this was massively controversial and hated in the south. Um, and um, it kind of caused the, the rise of Jacksonian Democrats as a, as a sort of reaction. Um, um, and they were a, um, a, fragment, a fragment of the, the old De Jacksonian, um, Jeffersonian Democrat Party, the Anti-Federalists. Um, and they were more the common men, um, led by Andrew Jackson, obviously, who believed that more people, sh like the common man should be the primary voice in American society, as opposed to bankers and merchants, which he really distrusted. Um, he didn't like that they made a lot of money without, quote unquote, doing anything. Um, so that was his main rationale behind um, not renewing the second bank of the United States um, charter, which obviously caused massive economic problems. Yeah, that was when you get with the uh, wildcat banks and um, what's the other one? I can't remember. And the pet banks? Pet banks, yes, thank you. Um, and another important thing, uh, we did mention Henry Clay, and I, this is worth noting as well because um, he was also very well known for his compromises. He did the Compromise of 1820, which is also known as the Missouri Compromise, to figure out how to balance the um, slave states and the non-slave states uh, because of the whole idea of if there was one, keeping the balance in the slave states and um, non-slave states led to uh, basically ties in the Senate. So if there was one balance, um, one way is to say there were more slave states and they would have more votes in the Senate and we would be able to pass legislation that would allow for benefits to them. Whereas um, if there were more free states and they, they would be able to do the same, be able to pass legislation that favored them. And me, the other side didn't like either of those things. They were like, no, we got we went our way. So to compromise, they uh the compromise of 1820 led to um you could not um admit more than uh, you could not admit just one state to the union at a time you had to bring them in in pairs in order to keep that balance you would have to bring in one northern state and one southern state um mm -hmm. i don't remember uh the other state that was brought in with missouri but uh, i do know mean, there was um they split Massachusetts because before this, right. Massachusetts they made the same state, so they made, they made Maine its own state. And that uh, right, right, right. And then um, that also established the I think it's the twenty four forty line. Um, so anything under the twenty four forty parallel would be a slave state, except for Missouri, which was above it. And then um, 
everything above the 2440 would be a free state, which we ran into problems with that when we admitted California to the union, or we tried to, um, as well as when we tried to admit Texas to the union, because it was already an established free state, because Texas was Mexican, and then it became its own country for a little bit, and then it was like, hey, let's let us into the union, and then the United States said no, because you're going to offset the balance and dribble the 2440. So I think that's that in California is what led to the uh, 1850 compromise, which was another Henry Clay thing. And he was like, what, 70 or 80 at the time? Yeah, it was quite old. This was I like his last raw. I don't know right. if he died before the Civil War. Yes. Um, I'll write that one. It's done. Um, Scopes Monkey Trial. Yes, Song, and that's a good uh, reply. Existing debate between fundamentalism and modernism um, and the idea of like old ways, old ideas, staying with old things or embracing new ones. Um, that was at the beginning of the 1900s or 19, 1900s, 1920s in that general area, which was when the entire movement of modernism was kicking into gear after World War I. Um, and yes, it is 3630. Thank you for correcting me. I don't i'm not very good with numbers um and, but and the Sonia, impact yeah you're right when you say fundamentalism and modernism but you, you could probably also say um um between religion and science um yes because evolution is obviously a, a scientific theory and um, um it was the belief of a lot of religious conservatives um that the bible did not allow for um allow for evolution Know, a seven day creation and all. Um, so, yeah, just the tension. Yeah. Um, and the impact of that, let, uh, let me think. Because Scopes didn't win. So, I guess that allowed for more like government oversight into um, education because the whole idea of the Scopes trial was that uh, Scopes was teaching evolution in schools. Um, and the preacher in Tennessee, where he, um, the preacher from the Tennessee city where he worked was like, no, you can't do that. That's against the Bible. And so then that went to, uh, went to court and the court ruled in favor of William Jennings Bryan, who then died of a heart attack not long after because he gave it his all. Okay, most important trials to study. So you'll see you get a lot of responses. Um, Hussey versus Ferguson, very important. Um, it legalized segregation in the South. Um, and that lasted all into the Civil Rights Act of 1965. Um, Brown v. Board of Education, um, that's out of the time period. Mm -hmm. It's obviously good to know for, you know, for like life. Um, um, so still very important, but I, I probably wouldn't use that on my, um, on the DBQ. Um, my Birch versus Madison, yep, that established idea of judicial review. Um, the Supreme Court can declare a law unconstitutional. Um, Flanch versus Peck, um, I believe that was the first time the Supreme Court declared a state law unconstitutional. So it said, which is the federal government's authority over the states. Um, and Dred Scott versus Sanford. Um, yeah, that um, galvanized, really um, enraged Northerners um, because it declared, I think it declared the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional um, and it allowed for popular sovereignty and that was um, that was part of the reason um, the Republican Party was formed um, um, in reaction to this case, and also um, um, uh, the Compromise of 1850. Looks like there are a lot of other, yeah, there are a lot of others. Yeah, Court Monsu versus U.S. That one is um, I also believe that one is period eight, so that's not going to be on the exam. Um, Court Monsu is period seven. Um, that's, that's Japanese internment. Um, oh, true, true. So yeah, you could you could use that. Um, so um, you could maybe tie it into um, like oppression of minorities. Um, not really nativism, but um, the tension between um, the majority and the minority. And also, like, what constitutes um, as humane treatment of prisoners or whatever, because a lot of people, uh, like we call them internment camps and then we pointed figure fingers at the concentration camps. Um, mm -hmm. So like, I guess you could make a, some, something of a comparison there and how like American views of things uh, worked. Um, neutrality Act, 
those were um, Great Depression era, I believe. Um, yeah, that was post that was post World War One when the United States was like, no, we don't want to get into another war. We can't do this again. It's going to be bad. Um, again, going back to that idea of isolationism and stepping back from. Uh, this is a pretty wide ranging um, and catch all um, mm -hmm. catch all phrase for a lot of um, anti interventionist laws, but I. I think these refer to the acts in the 1930s that um, attempted to keep the U.S. out of World War, um, World War II. Um, as Nazi Germany was on the rise um, after the invasion of Poland in 1939, um, this is more um, dedicated toward World War II. Um, there was a lot of, um, na uh, not nativist, um, um, isolationist sentiment in the U.S. at, this, at um, right before World War I, or World War II. Both actually, but this refers to um, over two, right? And you're right, Elijah. That that act worked really well. I think, in general, that was to stop us from just going in because we wanted to. But once an attack was made on American soil, then we can't refuse that. We we've got to prove our, that we're American. We're strong. Um. But yeah, that it it was an attempt. All right, we're. We're at an hour right now. If there are no more questions, then I think we need to sign off. Unfortunately, um, um, we didn't get to um, practice analyzing documents, but right. if you buy that Crankcast and come out next Thursday, we'll for sure cover at least at least one DBQ then. So come back and join us in a week. Right. Two questions popped up. So um, 16th Amendment and 17th Amendment. Uh, I believe this is, actually six uh, sixteenth. Uh, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on income. So income tax. Sixteenth is income tax. Yep. Seventeenth is direct election of senators, and the seventeenth was a result of um, populism, which was a big movement in the Midwest during this time. Um, it was mostly rural farmers um, who um, wanted also wanted a silver standard. Um, so you could, there was maybe more currency um, in circulation. Um, uh, and yeah. They they kind of disappeared after the election of 1892, um, but this is a result of um, populist sentiments in the Midwest. The 17th Amendment. All right, McCullough versus Maryland and Marbury versus Madison. Um. And if I may add this, um, there is a good way to remember the order of the um, uh, of the amendments 16 through, through um, 20. Um, there's a little saying. It's called "Tax senators who drink with women until they can drink again." So you have tax 16 income taxes, senators 17 um, who drink. Um, that's prohibition. Being a prohibition with women. And that is um, 19th. Uh, oh, goodness. Um, women's suffrage, women's voting rights. Yes, and we do skip over lame, lame ducks, which is um, the period of time between election and inauguration. But that one's not terribly important. And then, of course, 21st is um, uh, the end of prohibition, 1930s, 33, I think. All right, McCullough versus Maryland was based on federal power um, or how how much the federal government had power over the states um, because there was a national bank and the state of Maryland tried to tax it. And so the um, Supreme Court led by John Marshall said, you can't do that. It's a federal bank. Um, federal over supersedes uh, state taxes there. And then Marbury versus Madison without saying I'm not great with Supreme Court cases. I apologize, guys. Again, that's another, um, that one is another federal government supersedes um, 
state government and um, that one was judicial review. I think we went over that a little bit before. Uh, American courts can um, take down laws in states if they're considered unconstitutional. Yeah, judicial review, that's right. All right, uh, free life session next Thursday. It, it is not free. Um, the cram session is going to be from four to nine Eastern. And again, that is uh, $5, um, five hour cram session. So um, there's we're, we're gonna be covering a lot. We're gonna try to cover like all the periods and all the themes on the exam. Um, it's gonna be <laughs> wild. <laughs> Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of it's gonna be a lot of learning, but it's gonna be a lot of fun as well. Yes, it's it's gonna be you guys' input, and we're gonna put it on screen, and we're gonna like facilitate review. Um, yes, if you did pay for the total cram pass, you're in. Um, but if you don't want to pay that full forty, um, then you can just pay a one-time ticket for five bucks and get in. Um, all right. I think Any... that's about all that we have. Um, yeah. Thanks all for coming. I definitely didn't expect most 80 people. Yes, that's a lot, you guys. I certainly um, hope we answer your questions. And if you have more, again, bring them next week or bring them to another um, another free stream. Yes. Um, last thing, this one is an important one since it is uh, about documents, which you didn't have time to go over. Um, how long should you spend analyzing documents? Okay, so the DBQ you have 45 minutes to do and five minutes to upload. I do not suggest get, biting into your upload time. So. Honestly, I think you should, it depends on how fast you write. Mm -hmm. I've heard suggested time being like 15 minutes to analyze the documents and then 30 minutes to just write. But if you take longer to write and put your argument together, then you may want to try to analyze your documents as you go. Um, that's what that's what I usually do. I look at my thesis, I scan through my documents, um, and then I start writing and analyze as I go, especially on an exam or a time thing, because you just you just don't have time. Um, and I would definitely type my essay to answer that second question. Um, unless you're a very slow typer, I would do uh, I I would just type it because um, that's going to be the easiest way to upload. Um, cause you have the whole copy and paste thing and writing it means you have to take a picture of it and then get it somehow to your computer. Or if you're, I mean, if you're on your phone, that's not as big of a deal. Um, but copy and paste seems like the most, the one with the least problems that might happen. So, um, yeah, that's my suggestion. Do you have anything else to add? Um, not much except that. Trying to predict what the DBQ will be on is good. It's it's just fine and great, but um, don't I I wouldn't recommend studying, um, focusing all of your studying on a few periods just because you've um, been on DBQ in a while. And um, the periods three and four are my, my personal prediction, but um, in your in your position, I would definitely say for everything. Oh no! Oh, it's, um, I'm not. I'm not criticizing at all. Um, I did the exact same thing when I took the course last year. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. It's certainly fun to um, make predictions about it, and then see if you're right, and post to all your friends. So, um, again, la last, very last question. Um, this goes back to what I said before. Would you all recommend writing out hip analysis or just trying to do it in your head? Depends on your time, how good you are with timing, how fast you can write, how good, how easily you can. Um, Write your essay once you have read through the documents. Um, personally, I'm going to just be doing it in my head for Euro because I it's going to take me too long to try to do the hip analysis um, off to the side. Um, so again, that's your personal that's your per personal preference. How you write your DBQs, how you can put them all together. Okay, so I think that's that's definitely all the time we have. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> For Thank you guys. Um, see you next week. Bye, all.